in the second half of the class. Hopefully all of you did very well on the uh, on the midterm. Uh, I'll be available later this week for an office uh, hour. If you guys want to jump in and join, I'll be sending that information along. But week nine is going to focus on chapter eight. And chapter eight all has to do with it the uh, organization of successful companies. So for this week, uh, I need you to obviously read chapter eight and watch this lecture and follow along with the chapter eight PowerPoint. In addition though, there's an assignment, uh, an organizational chart assignment, and I need you to create an organizational chart. Now an organizational chart maps the relationships among people working within an organization as we'll discuss today and who reports to who. So I'd like you to use PowerPoint or Google Slides, and I'm gonna demonstrate that here in a second, to create an organizational chart for a company with the following positions. The CEO, who's in charge of the entire company, then a marketing director and chief financial officer who both report to that CEO, and then within the marketing director, he oversees four marketing managers the production manager, and three first-line managers. The CFO directs three supervisors himself, so I'd like you to show you, me in the organizational chart those individuals as well. And then each manager and supervisor that's listed above oversees multiple workers. For simplicity's sake, include only three workers under each manager and supervisor. So again, It'd be helpful if you uh, draw this out on a piece of paper and then create it in a organizational chart. And how do you do that? Well, it's real simple. If you do have a, a PowerPoint, you just open up PowerPoint, create a new presentation. And what you can do here is add boxes and label those boxes um, very simply to um, add you know uh, the individual jobs so you can create a shape of a box and I'll give you the first one here double click the box and type in the job title then as you uh, as you um, add items let's add another box here you can then draw uh, you can then uh, draw lines in between each individual um, box. So I'm gonna draw a line from this box to this box, and you can see the line here. But this is exactly what I expect to see uh, as from your homework assignment. And again, the information that you'll need is right here in the organizational chart assignment. Now let's get to chapter eight. So, organizing for success. Well, teams, successful teams, build an organization from the bottom up. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's important that, um, it's important that you understand that when you have a product or service and you're creating an organization from the bottom up, one, you create a division of labor. Again, you identify how many people are needed and what roles are needed to create your product or service. From here, you divide those into separate tasks through job specialization. So for example, if you're, uh, if you're running a landscape company, you obviously know that you need to do uh, construction work. Now, what, what products and services are you offering within the uh, landscaping company? Uh, if you're offering concrete, installation. Maybe you'll need uh, a con some concrete people. Uh, maybe you'll need some labor uh, supervisors to uh, help dig and, and plant plants. Again, what we're trying to do here is divide the task through job specialization. Next, we'll set up teams or departments. This is called departmentalization. 
right? Because if you set up teams to handle certain uh, tasks and jobs, they can work. Uh, they can work uh, quickly and um, specifically on the job at hand. Next, we'll allocate resources and also assign specific tasks to to the um, individuals within that those departments. Next, we'll establish procedures. Procedures help keep uh, everybody in track and um, focused on their job. We'll develop an organizational chart based off of the procedures and the tasks and the individual teams and departments and who reports to who. Finally, adjusting the new realities. It's important to understand that sometimes it takes time to adjust to a, a specific role or a specific team, but it's important that you do adjust for a new organization structure. Often change in organizations is due to evolving business environments. This means that more global competition, declining economy, faster tech, and pressure to protect the environment can have an effect on your organization and how it's structured. Similarly, uh, what we're going through right now with COVID is is affecting uh, businesses and changing organizations. For example, I just read an article about, uh, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and the Cleveland Indians are laying off a bunch of their employees. They're, con uh, they're uh, contracting their number of their minor league baseball teams from six down to four. And all this is due to the fact that they lost money during the COVID uh crisis that we're experiencing now. So you can see how things like uh, declining economy or competition can change an organization and an organization structure. Customer expectations have also changed. Customers today want high quality products with fast friendly service and all at a low price. We live in a global economy today that's, that's uh, centered around the internet. It's very easy to go to a store, find something you like, and then pick up your cell phone and see if it's cheaper on Amazon. So unfortunately, companies have to be more streamlined and they have to produce products faster, maintain a high level of quality, and lower the price. The development of organizational design. Economy of scale. This means that companies can reduce their production costs by purchasing raw materials in bulk. The average cost of goods decreases as production levels rise. Mass production of goods leads to complexities in organizi organizing businesses. Now, the economies of scale. This is a, this is a concept that uh, my family deals with. Uh, my family owns a landscaping company in Ohio. And... Um, they reduce their production costs or services costs because they buy materials in bulk. They buy their landscaping goods in bulk. Uh, trees, shrubs, fertilizer, grass seed, they buy it all in bulk at the beginning of the year and maintain those plants throughout the year and pull from their own nursery. This allows them to buy uh, plants and um, fertilizer at a low cost and be able to deliver products and services uh, to goods to, to people uh, at a lower cost and compete. Now let's talk a little bit about the changing organization and a couple of theories and principles. The first one is Fails Principle, uh, Henry Fails Principles of Organization, which I'm sure you'll read in in your chapter. So let's talk about uh, some of the principles that fail uh, theorized about a uh, organization and what they should have. First, a unity of com command. Now th what this means is that employees should have only one supervisor. It leads to a much smoother organi running organization. Hierarchy authority. 
teams with the same objective should be working under the direction of that one manager using one plan. FAO theorized that this will ensure that action is properly coordinated. Next, we have a division of labor. When um, employees are specialized and separated into those uh, specializations, output can increase because they become increasingly skilled and efficient at exactly what they're doing. It allows for them to concentrate on one specialization. Next, fail uh, theorize that a subordination of individual interests to the general interests will help. So basically, this means that the interest of one employee should not be allowed to become more than those of the group. This includes managers. So again, the interest of one employee is not more important than the rest of the individuals that they work with, including the manager. Next. Uh, fail theorize that authority has to happen. Managers have to have that authority to give orders, but they also need to keep in mind that with authority comes some responsibility, a lot of responsibility actually. So they need to keep that in mind and not let it go to their head. Next, the degree of centralization. Now, this, this principle by fail refers to how close employees are to the decision-making process. It's important that you have a balance. It's important that employees are close to, the, uh, to make, helping make decisions, but not too close that it muddies the water, so to speak. Clear communication channels are also important between the manager and those employees. Uh, it's important that you keep those communication channels open and that they're allowed to communicate clearly between. Order is another principle that's important. Uh, the workplace facilities must be clean, tidy, and of course safe for employees. Everything should have its place and everything should function uh, cl clean and efficiently. Cleanliness is important, especially in production facilities, uh, and it can help. Uh, equity is also a principle that's important and fails uh, principle of organizations. Uh, principle or equity uh, managers should be fair to staff at all time, uh, both maintaining discipline as necessary and acting with kindness where appropriate. So again, treating e each individual on the team equally, kind, when app where appropriate. Next, the principle is a spirit de corps. And what this means is that organizations should tr strive to promote team spirit and unity and to um, really focus in on improving how they feel about that organization. And again, a lot of the HR departments um, spend a lot of time uh, with this principle and try to promote this principle. The second uh, organizational theory is by Max Weber. Max Weber's, uh, Max Weber's organization theories revolved around employees just need to do what they're told. In addition to FAIL's principles, Weber emphasized that there needs to be job descriptions. People need to have a clear idea of what they're doing, written rules, decision guidelines, and detailed records for each job, consistent procedures, regulations, and policies, and staffing and promotions are only based on qualifications. Now you can see both the principles have their flaws, uh, especially Weber's, but also they do have uh, some key items that help an organization run very smoothly. I think job descriptions are a very good way to keep everybody uh, focused and what they're supposed to be doing. It can also help with hiring and recruiting. It's kind of like a um, it's kind of like a contract of what uh, an employer expects an employee to do, it gives them a better idea. It's the syllabus, if you will, of the professional world. Now, turning principles into organizational design. 
when follow, following both Henry Fail and, and Max Weber, managers control workers. There's a clear hierarchy. And a hierarchy is a system in which one person is at the top of an organization and there is ranked or sequential ordering from the top down. There's a chain of command, the line of authority that moves from the top of the hierarchy to the lowest level. Now, your homework assignment is an organizational chart. And an organizational chart is a device, a visual device that shows the relationships among people and divides the organization's work. And it shows who reports to who. Here's a typical organizational chart. At the top, you have a president or a CEO. And then below them, they have uh, managers within uh, that report up to the president. Underneath the managers, there's supervisors. And then finally, the uh, little stick figures represent the uh, labor uh, and the individuals working underneath the supervisors. Now, this is a typical organizational chart. Later, we'll go over different types of organizational charts and different type of organizational flows. But as far as your homework is, uh, is concerned, this is what I'm expecting you to create. Bureaucratic organization. Bureaucracy is an organization with many layers of managers who set rules and regulations and oversee all decisions. It can take weeks or months to have information passed down to lower level employees. Bureaucracies can annoy customers. Let's look, let's look at the previous um, slide here. As you can see, this organizational chart, if the president up here wants to make a uh, announcement to the uh, bottom line employees, obviously he can send out a mass email or, or something like that. But think about the telephone game. Say the president um, talks to his manager of finance and he wants them to relay a message down to the uh, individual employees. Uh, the president has to talk to the manager. The manager then talks to one of his supervisors. Then the supervisors talk to the individual employees. Kind of like a game of telephone, the message can get uh, muddied. Same way is if a consumer or a customer talks to one of the individual employees to relay a message to the president, it could get uh, uh, muddied uh, and, and distorted before it reaches the president. This is why often customers uh, get upset with bureaucracies because uh, these people that they deal with at that lower level usually don't have the decision-making capabilities to make changes to the organization. So sometimes their requests fall on deaf ears. Now, when structuring your organization, you can choose centralized or decentralized authority. What do those mean? Centralized authority is when decision-making authority is maintained at the top level of management at the company's headquarters. A decentralized authority is when decision-making authority is delegated to lower level managers more familiar with the local conditions than head headquarters management could be. Think about this when it comes to retail stores. I use the example of Target all the time. Target has a very, uh, very structured organizational chain. However, they do have some uh, decentralized authority with local targets being able to make decisions about what products they carry and also how they go about hiring and how many people to have in staff. They have some somewhat a decentralized authority. Now there's some advantages and disadvantages to both. So let's take a look at the advantages for centralized. There's a great, greater top management control. There's more efficiency, a simpler distribution system, and a stronger brand and corporate image because there is one group of individuals organized and managing everybody. Some advantages of a decentralized structure. There's better app adaptation to what a customer wants because the management has an idea of local conditions. There's more empowerment of workers because they feel closer to the people making decisions. There's faster decision making because they don't have to go through corporate. And there's higher morale. There's more of a feeling of a localized team. Let's look at some disadvantages for both though. Under centralized, there's less responsiveness to customers. Again, because you have to go through all these layers. 
there's less empowerment for the local workers because they don't feel that they control anything. There's often inner organizational conflict because centralized say, okay, do this. And um, the individuals at the local area say, well, that won't work for our customers because they're different in this way. And there's also lower morale away from the headquarters. Some disadvantage for decentralized, though. There's less efficiency, um, less buying power. Uh, there's a complex distribution system. There's less top management control, and there's a weakened corporate image. So as you can see, there's some advantages and disadvantages to each way. Choosing the appropriate span of control. <coughs> what is span of control? It's the optimal number of subordinates a manager supervises or should supervise. When work is standard or standardized, broad spans of control are possible. What does this mean? Well, when work is very clear, clearly separated and very specific and standard, more people can be managed because there's less, uh, there's less deviation than um, you know, a, a more creative type of position. The appropriate span narrows at higher levels of the organization, meaning that uh, because they have more uh, reports and uh, more uh, details within and more standards within the organization, the span narrows at the top. The current trend today is reduce the number of middle managers and hire better lower level employees. Again, if we think about uh, the organizational chart here, the idea is to try to uh, hire employees uh, at the stick figure level that are more self-sufficient. That way we could cut down a number of first-line supervisors. This is the current trend. So, what is a tall and flat organization and, and how do we decide to choose between it? Well, a tall organization structure is an organizational structure in which the pyramidal organization chart would be quite tall because of the various levels of management. However, a flat organizational structure is an organization structure that is, um, has a few layers of management and a broad span of control. So if we're taking a look at this chart, this is a tall level of uh, organizational management. You see that there's, a multi there's four levels here. Whereas a flat organizational structure, there's only two levels here. So it's very flat and the owner manager deals with each specific uh, employee uh, individually. Flat organizations obviously are smaller companies usually because there's less people that an owner or manager has to has to help manage. Now there's some uh, advantages and disadvantages to both. Let's talk about the advantages for both broad and narrow. Broad manager, uh, broad manager span of control, there's reduced costs obviously because you have to hire l uh, less uh, managers more responsive to customers because you're uh, you're in you know dealing only a few levels down faster decision making and more empowerment with the employees with narrow there's more control by top management more chances for advancement because there's more management positions greater specializations greater uh, chances of special departments and there's closer supervision because people uh, are underneath um, a lot more managers. Some disadvantages for broad management are a flat organizational structure. There's fewer chances for advancement. There's overworked managers. There's a loss of control and less management expertise. However, some disadvantages with a tall or narrow um, organizational structure. There's less empowerment higher cost, delayed decision-making, and there's usually less response to individual customers. So let's weigh the advantages and disadvantages of departmentalization. And departmentalization is the dividing of organizational functions into separate units, right? Creating departments within an organization. Workers are grouped by skills, and expertise to specialize their skills. And again, you think that this is all good. 
Well, there's some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are the employees develop skills and progress within a department as they master those skills. The company can achieve economies of scale, and employees can coordinate work within the function, and top management can easily direct the activities within that group because that group is developing skills and only focusing on those on the um, responsibilities of that department. However, some disadvantages also uh, happen. Departments may not communicate well with other departments. Employees may identify with the department's goals rather than organizations. This happens quite frequently is, oh, well, I'm not going to worry about what that department is doing. I just got to focus on my job. Think about a sports team. Think about a sports team in the, let's talk football. Uh, each department, you have, the, uh, you have the offense, you have the defense, and you have the special teams. Now, um, if the offense is only concerned about their job, it's not going to lead to many wins because, again, you have to, you have to um, make sure that you know, you're worried about defense and special teams, too. It takes all three departments working well together. So sometimes focusing on department goals rather than the organization goals can lead to disaster for an organization. The company's response to external changes may be slow, too, if people are focusing only on their own department. People may not be trained to take different managerial responsibilities in two. Uh, in two. They may become specialists only with those type of individuals. And department mem mem members may engage in groupthink, and they may need outside input to think outside of their ways. So if we were going to departmentalize, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. The first one is by product, right? So if we're creating a department, um, the ideal, uh, one of the ideal ways to do it is by product. Uh, obviously, if you sell different products, let's take for this example, uh, your book, uh, your book producer, right? We can departmentalize by different types of uh, products, such as trade books, college textbooks. And technical books. Now, if we were going to uh, departmentalize by function, uh, you can see that each function listed here is an important aspect of the overall business production, marketing, finance, human resources, and accounting. So, if we think about that book example, instead of, uh, instead of departmentalizing by the types of books or types of products we have, we are uh, departmentalizing by the function that each individual uh, performs. By customer group, this is another popu popular way to depart departmentalize. Um, by consumers, maybe uh, consumer commercial users, B2B, so to speak, business to business. Uh, people that deal with manufacturers and people that deal with institutions. This is often done in sales organizations that uh, sell products to uh, individual uh, individuals, companies, governments, and uh, and other businesses. Geographic location is another way to uh, separate uh, your company. Uh, you can. Uh, put people into departments based off of the territories that they cover. This is often quite uh, useful in international businesses because each each area geographic location often has its own currency, uh, cultures, and norms. You can also departmentalize by process. Uh, for instance, if we were a uh, machine shop, we may uh, we may have a department of cutters, dryers, and also stitchers. Now there's no one right way to departmentalize. It's important that you keep in mind the products and services that you're offering as well as where you're offering them to. Line organizations. Line organizations have two way, two li two way lines of responsibility, authority, and communication running from the top to bottom with all the people reporting to only one supervisor. There's no specialists for legal, accounting, human resource, or IT departments. Line managers issue orders, enforce discipline, and adjust the organization to changes. Line personnel are the employees who are part of a chain of command that is responsible for achieving organizational goals. 
line personnel have the authority to make policy decisions. Staff personnel are employees who advise and assist the line personnel in meeting their goals. Staff personnel make up the marketing, legal, IT, and HR department. Now, here's an example of a line and staff organization. As you can see, there's a CEO at the top. And then below the CEO reporting directly to them is the plant manager who oversees three supervisors and assembly line workers. Now you can see the HR department, the legal department, and the marketing research department work independently but also work, work with each other and the plant manager to help uh, run the organization. A matrix style organization Specialists from different parts of the organization are brought together to work on specific projects but still remain a part of the line and staff structure. Emphasis is placed on product development, creativity, special pro projects, rapid communication, and interdepartmental work. So let's take a look at a, a matrix organization. As you can see, there's individual vertical lines. We have a president and then a VPs of individual departments. But what's interesting here is that the project managers work both vertically reporting to a project manager management the VP but they also work horizontally uh, with individuals from each team and sometimes these individuals may change but each individual team uh, is uh, a project manager manages horizontal as opposed to vertically which is a very interesting. So employee A has actually two bosses, a VP of manufacturing and then a boss up manager on that individual project. It's an interesting uh, organizational chart. And often these organizational charts work very well with research and development type companies. Some advantages and disadvantages to a matrix style organization. Some advantages are managers have flexibility in assigning people to projects, right, based off a of skill set. So again, if employee A is better at working on a certain project, they may be assigned to that project. Uh, Interorganizational cooperation and teamwork is encouraged because you're all pulling towards the same goals. Creative solutions to product development problems are produced and organizational resources are always used efficiently. Well, some disadvantages come with it too. It's costly and complex. Just look at it. Who's who's boss? Employees may be confused on when their loyalty belongs. Do you am I loyal to the VP of marketing or am I loyal to my product manager? It, it sometimes gets confusing. Good interpersonal skills and cooperative employees are a must for this type of organization, and it's may only be a, a uh, temporary solution to a long-term problem. Let's take a look uh, at uh, cross-functional and self-managed teams. Cross-functional self-managed teams are groups of employees from different departments who work together on a long-term basis. A way to fix a problem of matrix-style teams is to establish long-lived teams. For instance, uh, we stay with the employee A, employee B, employee C, employee D reporting under that project manager um, and that way they uh, don't slip between different project managers and they usually keep with the same teammates, same project manager and again it's less complicated um, as far as who reports to who. Teams are empowered to make decisions without management approval all, um, in this type of an organization. Cross-functional teams work best when the voice of the customer is heard. Teams that include customers, suppliers, and distributors go beyond organizational boundaries. Government coordinators may assist in sharing market information across uh, organizational boundaries. And government coordinators may assist in sharing large um, information across national boundaries. Managing interactions amongst firms. Networking is used uh, to link organizations and allow them to work together on common objectives. Networking is, uh, is a very powerful tool. It provides transparency um, 
And usually uh, organizations can um, actually take steps in real time or the present moment in actual time where something takes place. Most companies are no longer self-sufficient. They're often part of a global business network. Um, cooperation and networking is a very important concept in today's business organization. Often small businesses join small business networks to learn from each other to help each other succeed. Now transparency occurs when a company is open to other companies uh, that electronic information is shared as companies were one. A virtual corporation is a temporary network organization made up of replaceable firms that join and leave as needed. Benchmarking, this happens when a company compares an organization's best practices, processes, and products against other corp companies and corporations. If a company can't do as well as the best, they can try to outsource that function. And core competencies are functions that the organization can do as well or better than any other organization in the world. So that's it for chapter eight. Remember uh, to uh, finish the chapter eight assignment as well as to uh, read chapter eight. Until next week, have a fantastic week.